Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in today's video we're going to be looking at the first half of the Mesozoic Life History presentation. So, not going to lie to you, this is one of my favourite presentations because of course this is the one that contains the dinosaurs. Okay, let's get going. So, what was happening with life during the Paleozoic? So, during the Paleozoic, we went from relatively primitive, soft-bodied, multicellular life, and we saw quite a diversification of species as we made our way from the Cambrian through to the Permian. So, some of the important changes that we saw were, number one, the appearance of the Shelley invertebrates. So, we know that those began to appear in the Cambrian, and of course, we saw a really big diversification of them as part of the Cambrian explosion. We also saw the appearance of the cephalopods, that's the group that includes organisms like squid. And one subphylum of the cephalopods, the Ammonoidea, are going, uh, they make their appearance in the Devonian, and they're going to become very, very important in the Mesozoic especially. So we also saw the appearance of the corals, or more accurately, the coral-like organisms. So we saw the uh, Archaeocythids, the Cambrian, then we saw the, the appearance of the Stromatopoids in the Ordovician, and then we see the appearance of the Tabulate and Rugose corals later on. And of course, all these organisms will form quite extensive reef deposits, uh, especially during the Paleozoic, because we had so many of these nice, relatively shallow, relatively warm uh, apiric seeds, which are absolutely perfect for reef formation. So we also saw clumps of green algae on the banks of rivers and lakes begin to evolve into land plants. We saw the appearance of the primitive vertebrates, so if you remember, that was a group of organisms uh, who were very early fish, and of course they possess something which we refer to as a notochord, which is essentially a rod-like structure made out of cartilage, which is, a, uh, which is akin to a spinal column. Now, from the primitive vertebrates, we then had the evolution of the vertebrates. So if you remember, a vertebrate is something that has a segmented spinal column, a segmented backbone. And of course, the vertebrates were uh, first represented by the fish, and as we know, the fish diversified in a very big way in the Paleozoic, especially from the Devonian onwards. So in terms of the fish, we obviously see the relatively primitive fish, so we see the uh, groups like the ostracoderms, the, uh, the, the bony-skinned fish, eventually begin to evolve, and they uh, give rise to two important groups of fish, the ray-finned fish and the lobe-finned fish. Of course, we know that the ray-finned fish account for a substantial portion of all fish species that we have now. And of course, we know the lobe-finned fish are important to us because it's actually uh, it's actually uh, amphibians who are going to evolve from the lobe-finned fish. So, of course, as you can see below, lobe-finned fish eventually gives rise to the amphibians. Of course, the amphibians move onto land. We then have the amphibians giving rise to the reptiles. And by the time we come to the end of the Paleozoic, we have the appearance of a rather mammalian-like reptilian group called the Therapsids, and of course they are eventually going to give rise to the mammals. So there was lots of stuff going on in the Paleozoic from an evolution point of view, it was extremely exciting. And then after all that hard work, the Permo-Trias mass extinction happens and everything gets absolutely pummeled. And so we lose a substantial portion of marine organisms, we lose a substantial portion of life on the continents, and it's about as close as we've ever come to a complete resetting of life on Earth. So obviously, as we move into the Mesozoic, we're starting from a, a position where there are going to be loads of environmental niches left wide open, and so what we're going to see is we're going to see life powering into those niches and trying to fill them and essentially come up with the best animals to fill that particular environment. Okay, so let's start with the ocean. So let's begin with the marine invertebrates and the phytoplankton. So what were the main changes that we begin to see as we transition from the Paleozoic into the Mesozoic? Well, the first and arguably the most important one is we see the bivalves make their move and become dominant over the brachiopods. So if you remember, the bivalves and the brachiopods are what we would essentially both call shellfish. But of course, we know the bivalves are actually part of the phylum mollusca, whereas the brachiopods are a phylum of their own. By the way, excuse my dog sneezing in the background. So the brachiopods had been the dominant shelly invertebrate species during the Paleozoic. Uh, 
Now what happens is, is at the end of the Paleozoic, when we have the Permatrice mass extinction, the Brachiopods really get hit very, very hard. And this is the moment that the bivalves essentially have their chance to essentially take over from the brachiopods and really become the dominant marine invertebrate species. And that's exactly what they do. So the bivalves in particular diversify to move into the infaunal environment from the epifaunal. So when we were looking at, you know, at, uh, at the bivalves in the Paleozoic, they were present, but a lot of them were on the epifaunal environments. They were sitting on the seafloor. Now, of course, this from a defensive point of view is not that great because you're exposed, you can be attacked by predators. The brachiopods, on the other hand, they covered both the epifaunal and the infaunal environment. So some species of brachiopod would partially or fully bury themselves and thereby give themselves a certain degree of protection. Now, what we see is we see the bivalves moving into the infaunal environment and kicking out the brachiopods. And so once the, once the bivalves have taken over the infaunal environment in a, in a big way, then of course that gives them quite a significant evolutionary advantage because of the protections offered, and they really begin to build off that particular starting point. So what else do we see? Well, we also see the appearance of the uh, sclaterian coral. So this is actually what we refer to as a coral. This is a proper coral, the kind of animal we're used to now. And we're going to see them make their appearance as part of the reef building uh, fauna of the Mesozoic. And we're steadily going to see them become more and more dominant. We're going to see the cephalopods and the gastropods become far more important. So, of course, the gastropods are the snails. So we're going to see sea snails especially becoming a very, very big group. And we're going to see the cephalopods become an absolutely massive group because of the uh, subphylum Ammonoidea, so the group that includes ammonites, who are going to become extraordinarily numerous in the Mesozoic oceans. We're also going to see some very big changes when it comes to uh, micro, microscopic life within the water column. So we're going to see the foraminifera, so of course now they're zooplankton, so they're technically carnivorous single-celled organisms. We're going to see them diversify. We're going to see the coccolithophores, the diatomes, and another group that I haven't listed here called the dinoflagellates are going to make their first appearances in the Mesozoic. Now they're phytoplankton, so they're photosynthetic organisms. And so what we're seeing is we're going to see a really big diversification, especially in these photosynthesizing single-celled uh, marine organisms. And of course, this diversification and the explosion in their populations is going to provide essentially the first source of food for the marine environments. And because they're so numerous, we're going to see these uh, marine environments become very, very productive because there's so much food around. So, of course, when it comes to the general uh, Mesozoic uh, marine fauna, we see the mollusks, so the bivalves, we see the cephalopods and the gastropods become extremely important. So we can see a lot of bivalve, cephalopod and gastropod fossils in Mesozoic rocks. So let's look at the cephalopods. So the cephalopods evolved rapidly and being nectonic, so they lived in the water columns, so they swam, they are very, very widespread. Now, this means they are excellent guide fossils because if you look at Mesozoic marine rocks, the cephalopods, especially the ammonites, are everywhere. Now, the cephalopods in the Mesozoic were dominated by the group Ammonoidea, and the group Ammonoidea contains three groups. Okay, so we got the, uh, the Gernetites, the Ceratites, and the Ammonites. Now, if we just come over here, the uh, goniotites, now they actually died out in the Permian, so they're a Paleozoic group, so unfortunately by the time we make it into the Mesozoic, they're gone. In terms of the, the ceratites, well, they were gone by the Mid-Triassic, so they were also a Paleo they also crossed over from the Paleozoic, but they didn't really make it too far in. Now, the main, the main group in the Mesozoic are going to be the Ammonites, and the Ammonites um, are going to persist into the Jurassic and they're going to make it all the way to the end of the Cretaceous and they're going to be an extremely important marine organism. Now in terms of separating these three groups we actually do it part you know one of the methods we use anyway is using what's referred to as the suture lines. So a suture line is a mark on the shell which is produced where the scepter which are these pieces of shell which separate the chambers 
make contact with the external part of the shell, which we call the uh, frangema cone. So where the two make, uh, make contact, we're going to see these lines on the shell, which we call uh, suture lines. Now, the thing we notice is that when we look at the suture lines for these three different groups, we can see distinct changes. So if we start up here in the top left, we have the nautiloids. Now, the nautiloids are the group from which the aminoidia will evolve. And as you can see, uh, the, um, the nautiloids have these very simple, relatively flat suture lines on the shell. So the, the uh, nautiloids are going to give rise to the, uh, the goniotites, and you can see they have slightly more complex suture lines. As we move into the, uh, the serotites, you can see the suture lines are getting even more complex. And by the time we're into the ammonites, the suture lines are extremely convoluted. And so if we come over here, we can see the same thing summarized in this diagram. So you can see that as we're moving through each group, the suture lines are getting more and more complex. And so what we can do is at a very you know, relatively crude level, we can use suture patterns to say, right, is this a, a gonotite, a serotite, or an ammonite I'm looking at? And from that, you can you know, use it to crudely date the sediment you're looking at. And then obviously you would go in and do some finer research to definitively identify the species you're looking at and then get a more definitive date for the layer of rock you're looking at. Now, in terms of the uh, ammonites themselves, well, we can see we have this rather distinct coiled shell, which is made up of numerous chambers, and each chamber is separated by a scepter. You can see it here. We've already discussed them. So you can see the shell itself is, uh, is rather uh, complex, so it has quite a lot of uh, topography on the shell. So often you'll see them uh, as quite ridged. There are a few more smoother shelled varieties, but the vast majority of ammonites will tend to have these lumps on the surface. That's all, they're also associated with the point where the scepter actually meet the uh, frangipico and the, essentially the shell. Now, in terms of the cephalopod itself, obviously the cephalopod would be living in the uh, the, you know, the the final chamber, and the shell itself would be orientated with the animal at the bottom. So, in, in reality, looking at this ammonite here, the image should be flipped ninety degrees. So, this chamber here would be at the bottom of the image. In terms of the rest of the chambers, to some degree the animal had the capacity to either fill the chambers with gas or water. Of course, the more chambers are filled with water, the heavier it will be, and obviously it will then sink in the water column. In contrast, if it pumps more gas into the chambers, the lighter the organism will be, and it will rise up in the water column. So we see ammonites diversifying the Mesozoic in a really, really big way, and some of them become absolutely huge. So the largest ones are approximately two meters in diameter. So, so the shell would measure from there to there two meters. So that's a pretty huge animal. Now, the majority of the ammonites are going to form these tightly coiled shells. So they're going to have a shell that looks like this. However, there were also some which are what we refer to as uncoiled, and you can actually see a picture of an uncoiled ammonite behind the text here. Now, this group is rather interesting. So they appear to have been near ben uh, benthotic, so they, they hovered just above the seafloor, and they probably just floated just off the seafloor, and they waited for something to just pass in front of them, at which point they would grab it and try and eat it. So the interesting thing is that this uncoiled morphology actually offers quite a lot of stability. So think of it like a set of scales. So obviously you've got the cephalopod, the animal itself is going to be over here on the right hand side, living in these chambers there. So obviously the animal is going to weigh quite a lot. And so what you do is you actually have a counterweight at the other end to balance out the weight of the cephalopod here. And so this would have meant that the organism could have floated just off the seabed. It would have been naturally very, very stable, and it would have just waited until something happened to pass in front of it, at which point it would spring into action. Now, in terms of the coiled ammonites, that design is also actually extremely intelligent. So if we look at the nautiloid down here, it gives you some kind of idea of what they would have looked like. So the shell would have been coiled, and you can see the uh, what would have been the ammonite. Of course, now remember, this is a nautiloid. They're not the same creature. They're related to each other, but they're not exactly the same. We can see that the, the cephalopod itself would have been located at the bottom of the shell. 
So once again, if we look at this coiled shell here, the cephalopod would have been in the, the final chamber here, and this shell would have had, essentially should be at 90 degrees, so this chamber should be down here at the bottom. So the great thing about this particular design is, is it's actually naturally very, very unstable. So what's going to happen is, is if an ammonite or a nautiloid is threatened by some kind of predator, what it will do is it will blast water out of its mouth to essentially propel itself like a jet. Now, because the shell is very upright, it means that as it passes through the water, it's naturally very, very unstable. And so this means as the nautiloid or the ammonite fires water out to propel itself, it means the flight path of it as it's moving through the water is going to be very, very irregular. So it's going to be, you know, a very, very chaotic flight path. And so this is exactly what you want if you're trying to avoid a predator. Of course, the more erratic your, your, you know, your escape route is, the more difficult it's going to be for the predator to catch you. And so it's a really, really good evolutionary design. Now, we see the ammonites dying out at the end of the Cretaceous, and this is mostly due to the nice, warm, shallow seas that we see throughout much of the uh, Mesozoic beginning to retreat. And of course, this regression reduces the amount of habitat available for ammonites. It also reduces the availability of these very, very highly productive shallow marine environments where there's lots and lots of food. And so all of a sudden we begin to see the ammonite populations, which are absolutely huge, beginning to crash in quite a big way as essentially they have less places, fewer places to live and less food to eat. And so obviously it's a bit of a double whammy and it you know, does for them. Now, uh, two related groups do manage to make it from the Mesozoic into the Cenozoic, and of course these are the Nautiloids, which we've already looked at over here, and the Coleoids, which includes the group Cuttlefish. Of course, we also have squids and octopi making their way into the uh, Cenozoic as well. So if we just get rid of the text here, you can see, oh, went too far there. You can see this uh, this uncoiled ammonite, and it's a, it's an absolutely brilliant design, using the, uh, the the essentially the end of the shell here as a counterweight to the mass of the uh, the cephalopod itself. So we see the bivalves and the echinoids. So if you remember, the echinoids is the group that includes the, the sea urchins. We begin to see them diversify with some species moving from the epifaunal environment, the seafloor, into the infaunal environment. So, of course, we've already discussed how the bivalves make their way into the sediment in quite a big way. But we also see the sea urchins doing the same thing. So what we see when we look at Mesozoic sea urchins is we actually see quite a simplification of their shells. So a lot of sea urchins, and if you think of a sea urchin now, you'll naturally think of something that's covered in, in spines for defense. And that's because that sea urchin is living on the seafloor. Now, the thing is, if you wanted to take that kind of shell and dig through the sediment, it wouldn't work because the spines essentially are going to get in the way. Then they're going to make it very difficult to move through the sediment. And so what we see is we see a simplification of these uh, sea urchin shells during the Mesozoic. So we see the spines getting smaller and in some cases completely disappearing. And this means it becomes easier for them to move through the sediment. So we can see them moving into the infaunal environment. Now, the driving force behind this movement into the infaunal environment was likely predation. So fish and cephalopods essentially were, you know, very important predators. And of course, the bivalves and the echinoids would have been doing everything they could to you know, get away from them. In terms of oysters and clams, so these are epifaunal suspension, suspension feeding bivalves, they become particularly diverse and abundant, and they remain important marine invertebrates even now. So you can actually find Mesozoic limestones, which are just stuffed with oyster shells. So in some places, they were extremely, extremely common. Now, obviously, as we've discussed, we have during the Mesozoic as well, we all we have these widespread, warm, clear, shallow seas. And of course, these are going to be the perfect locations for reef formation. And so just like in the Paleozoic, we are going to see a lot of reef development in the Mesozoic.
Now, in terms of the reefs themselves, they actually take quite a long time to recover from the Permotrias mass extinction. So that the Permotrias mass extinction does a lot of damage to reef communities. And it's not until the middle Triassic that we actually see reef communities kind of making it back to the same levels that we saw towards the end of the Permian. So it was quite a long recovery time, and that shows you just how, how badly damaged these reef communities were by the Permo-Trias mass extinction. So the Triassic, of course, is going to see the first appearance of the Skeletarian corals. Of course, those are the group of organisms which we would classify as a coral. If we saw them now, we'd say, right, that's a coral. And they're going to become the major reef building organism. So we're going to see them become more and more important as we move through the Mesozoic. And then, of course, as we go into the Cenozoic, we're going to see them become the dominant reef building organism. Now, the origin of the uh, Skeletarian corals is actually a little bit uncertain. Um, however, one of the things that uh, makes them very resilient is the fact that they can survive in a quite a broad range of water depths. And this means that, you know, as we were moving towards the end of the Mesozoic and we were seeing these shallow warm seas uh, disappearing, of course, this actually went and stressed other marine invertebrate groups. But the Skeletarian corals, because they could survive in a range of different conditions, they were a little bit more robust. And so they managed to make it through the, uh, the KT mass extinction in better shape than other reef building organisms. And so obviously, as we move into the Cenozoic, they have a very strong starting point and we see them begin to explode and become the dominant reef building organism in the Cenozoic. Now, the other important reef building organism in the Mesozoic are the rudists. So the rudists are actually bivalves. So they are one of the times where a bivalve does not have matching valves. OK, if you remember, one of the things that most bivalves have is both halves of the shell. The valves will match. There'll be mirror images of each other. In the case of the rudists, this isn't the case. So we see the Rudis uh, present from the late Jurassic all the way through to the end of the Cretaceous, and they make absolutely excellent dating evidence. So they're, they're a great fossil for doing biostratigraphy. Now, Rudis went and formed very extensive linear reef bodies, and these reefs could be huge. So they could be hundreds of kilometers in length and hundreds of meters in height. So really, really big uh, reef communities. Now, the thing about the Rudis is, is they came in at a huge range of sizes, from just a few centimetres to the largest example, which would have been about a metre in size. And when they went and died, they would just fall over. And of course, you might be able to see um, in the picture at the back here, uh, these are actually two Rudis next to each other. You can see the Rudis have this kind of horn-shaped morphology. So they start off with a, a, a narrow end, and they become broader as you move towards the top. And what we see is that when they would die, they would simply fall over. And so the reef communities would be made up of this pile of rudest uh, skeletons. And the thing is, is because they just fell randomly and because they were on the whole quite large, often tens of centimetres in size, it would mean that there would be lots of spaces in between the rudists in this pile, in, in between its rudest skeletons in this pile of material. And so, of course, this means the limestone that forms from this uh, concentration of carbonate material is also going to be highly porous. There's going to be lots of holes in it, lots of voids. And this means it's going to be an absolutely great reservoir rock for hydrocarbons. And so it's not uncommon to find um, oil deposits and gas deposits within these Mesozoic uh, carbonates because they're just so porous. Now, in terms of the Rudis themselves, the KT mass extinction isn't actually what gets rid of them. We actually see Rudis beginning to become extinct about 3 to 1.5 million years before the KT mass extinction. So they were already on the way out. And the reason for this is very likely because of decreasing sea levels and decreasing ocean temperatures. So obviously, as we've already touched on, as we are in the as, as we move through the Mesozoic, we have nice, uh, you know, very very common shallow warm seas in the Cretaceous, and then all of a sudden at the end of the Cretaceous, the sea level begins to drop, and so we start to lose all these nice warm shallow seas. So first of all, the amount of in, the amount of available area for these rudists to live in is decreasing. 
And then on top of that, as we discussed, the continents are moving towards their modern positions. This obviously has very significant implications for ocean circulation. And so this means that we begin to see some areas of the globe which were relatively warm all of a sudden start to become a lot cooler. And of course, the Rudists don't like this drop in temperature. They like these more warm water, tropical conditions. And of course, as a lot of this very warm water begins to disappear, once again, that's another problem which they just can't get over. And so we begin to see the Rudists on their way out about 3 to 1.5 million years before the KT mass extinction. Now, in terms of the phytoplankton, so the photosynthetic organisms, so these single-celled organisms living in the water column, we see the appearance of three very important groups, the coccolithophores, the diatomes, and the dinoflagellates. So the coccolithophores make their appearance in the Middle Jurassic, and they've made it through to the present day. And they are covered in calcareous plates called coccoliths, and they're very, very widely distributed. They're a very, very common organism. And so if we just jump to the next page, here actually is a coccolith. So you can see it's approximately spherical, and you can see it's covered in these circular plates, which are the coccoliths. And so, and so you know, obviously when the organism dies, the shell itself will fall apart, the coccoliths will separate, and they'll get incorporated into the sediment. And then you can just come along and you can, you know, you can see them down the microscope or you can, you know, you can uh, sieve the sediment to remove them and you can find the coccolith, uh, you can find the coccoliths and you can use them to essentially date the sediment. We also see the appearance of the diatomes. So they appear in the Cretaceous, and once again, they've made it through to the present day. And in the case of the diatomes, their skeletons are made of silica, SiO2. And the diatomes are most abundant in cooler water. So this is a, this is a very important change. So as we've discussed, the continents towards the end of the Mesozoic are moving towards their current positions. And this means that we have uh, the formation of more isolated bodies of seawater. So we have the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, North Pacific, South Pacific, and of course we have the uh, Circum uh, Antarctic uh, current. So we have these isolated bodies of water and in the higher latitudes, these bodies of water are going to start getting a lot colder than they were. And so what we see is we see the appearance of this uh, group of single-celled photosynthesizing organisms, the diatomes, moving into these colder water environments and beginning to exploit them. Because these environments are suddenly getting a lot harder for other organisms that would otherwise have lived there quite happily, like the coccolithophores, for instance. And so we see the diatoms moving in and beginning to become dominant in these colder waters. The other group that make their appearance are the dinoflagellates, and we see them appearing in the Triassic, and once again, they've made it all the way through to the present day. So these guys have organic shells, and they are a major producer in warm waters, so they tend to be limited to more tropical conditions. So they're actually a mixotrophic species, so many of them are photo, uh, photosynthesizing. However, some of them are actually, will actually ingest prey or food particles. They're technically zooplankton. So dinoflagellates are a little bit more of a, a mixed group compared to some of the others. So if we look, here are our coccolithophores, obviously covered in these circular coccoliths. Here we have some diatomes, their shells are made of the SiO2, so silica. And here we have the dinoflagellates. And of course we can see, well as we just discussed, their shells are organic in origin. Now of course the other group we can't ignore are the foraminifera. So the foraminifera are zooplankton, so they will actively uh, hunt other, uh, other small organisms or they will simply grab small particles of food. And in terms of the foraminifera, well, they've actually been around since the Cambrian, so they're a super, super uh, successful group, and they're still around now. Now, we see that uh, during the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic, we see the foraminifera diversifying in a big way. There's a lot of variation. Now, many uh, genuses of foraminifera become extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So the, the KT mass extinction does a lot of damage to the foraminifera community. However, they survive, they make it through into the Cenozoic, and they re-diversify from there. Now, in terms of the foraminifera, they're a very, very important primary consumer. So they're kind of like the first predator in the food chain. So, the, you know, so they would, for instance, you know, go after the coccolithophores.
Now, the vast majority of foraminifera are dominantly, well, they're dominantly marine, so they dominantly live in salt water, and they're benthotic, so they, they're, you're going to have them towards the seabed or in the, the sediment of the seafloor itself. So, um, in terms of the foraminifera itself, if we just get rid of some of that text there, you can see here is a foraminifera. And just to give you some idea of the difference of scale, this spherical thing here is a coccolithophore. And so you can see the shell of the foraminifera, which is called a, a, which is called a test, uh, protects the organism and allows the organism to maintain stable conditions around itself. So essentially it allows it to create its own little isolated world to help protect the organism. You can see though that the shells are full of holes and emanating from these holes you have uh, these things which are essentially called uh, pseudopods, for want of a better way of describing them, they're tentacles. And the pseudopods are quite useful because they can be used for locomotion, so they can be used in a, as a very crude leg to actually move the foraminifera across the seafloor, or they can also be used for actually grabbing food. And if they catch a food particle, you'll actually see the pseudopods in some cases can actually envelop the food particle and they can begin to digest it. And so if we just get rid of all the text completely, I, I really love this picture of the foraminifera right here. You can see the, the difference in scale compared to the coccolithophore here. And you can see just how small the coccolithophore is when compared to the much larger foraminifera. Okay, so do you know what? This is actually a really good place to stop. So stop the presentation, get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water, take five or ten minutes to relax, and please come back for part two.